Um, our next talk is on making storylets work for you, how to build a quality-based narrative. Uh, the speakers are Josh Grams, who has been a math geek, a word nerd, and a mostly hobbyist programmer since he was a kid, and a full-time small organic farmer since 2007. Um, he's played a lot of the Discworld mud and a fair amount of IF, but never has gotten around to writing any himself. Uh, in contrast, Kat Manning is an IF writer currently working at Riot Games. Uh, she loves graffiti, ancient, modern, and imagined, and cityscapes, especially the ones in someone's head. And here is their presentation. Hey, I'm Kat Manning, and with Josh Grams, we'll be speaking to you today about storylit design, why it's so useful, and how you might go setting about setting up this in Twine uh, using Josh's tiny QBN framework. My intent with this presentation here is to address how to work with common design issues in storylets, and so I will talk about some design techniques broadly before diving into a couple of examples using Josh's work. Storylets are an enormously useful design tool. Narrative designers can cede a significant amount of control to their players without creating too high of an authoring burden on themselves, and the system is designed so that individual player paths through the narrative possibility space can create surprising emergent stories that the designer may not have initially had in mind. Even better, from my perspective, is the fact that if you realize 80% of the way through your project that you need a new story beat in the middle, you can slot it directly in without having to rewrite the rest of the content from that point on. Storylets! Good for players, good for designers. Uh, and so we're going to turn to the next slide to answer the question, what is a storylet? Before we get too far into this presentation, uh, I want to start off with a definition of this term uh, coined by Emily Short. A number of interactive experiences, from indie to AAA games, use something that qualifies as what we're going to call a storylet. Uh, they just call them something unique and proprietary. But once we start thinking of all of these patterns as storylets, we can see how flexible a tool they actually are. So a storylet system is made up of the following parts. Bits of interactive material that we are showing to the player in some sort of order. Our system will determine what that is. Selection criteria, qualities and rules that determine when to offer that content. Um, and those are gonna vary on a lot of different things. Stats, progress measures, best match calculations like you have in games like King of Chicago, uh, or even rule sets like awkward sims can't initiate smooth flirting. And then eventually each bit of content will have an effect on the world state. Uh, state changes will occur that uh, the content has once fired and which will often become some kind of qualities or prerequisites that go back into the selection criteria and on and on and on. And so with this design, what we create is a possibility space that the player has more granular control over than they do in a linear path design, as shown here, where they might be locked into one arc after a specific number of actions, certain number of specific actions rather. This branch and bottleneck design, as you see on the left, uh, also accomplishes different effects than storylets do. I should say that this isn't always a clear dichotomy, especially because storylets and branch and body bottleneck aren't mutually exclusive tools, as you can see in the below image, which is a storylet designed version of a branch and bottleneck. You can switch between methods in your design in general. Very few games are pure storylet based only, uh, and once you get into a branch and bottleneck structure of sufficient length, interest, and complexity, you're basically doing storylets anyway, or you should be, and you should embrace that. On a very small scale, a branch and bottleneck scene and a storylet scene might feel pretty similar, but they're both design structures that are more useful and more visibly useful at scale. So as we see in the third example at the bottom, we can use storylets to implement a general branch and bottleneck structure. If we want more narrative velocity, we'd probably want to use a more traditional branch and bottleneck design, as up at the top left, uh, because even doing a hybrid allows for more variation than the traditional structure might allow for. We can slot things in between all of these progress qualities, right, where we can't necessarily do that in the traditional linear branch and bottleneck. Storylets seed authorial control, either to the player or to chance. So if, if fortuitous juxtapositions are part of your design, a scene might read very differently depending on where it's placed in the narrative. So in a branch and bottleneck structure, a tense scene will look like a series of challenges that the player goes through. With storylets that depend on player agency, you might have something like, there are 12 ways you can approach a problem, pick three or pick one three times and see how those go. 
And when the computer curates the storylets, you can have a system like a drama manager that checks in and says, okay, how is the mission going? Relaxed? How tense should it be? More tense? Do we want more tense? Let's throw some tension in. In other words, it's tuned to the emotional or experiential effect that the designer is going for, regardless of how the player has navigated the game space thus far. So I'm going to hand over to Josh for this next slide. Right, so why would we do this in Twine? Um, there aren't a lot of other tools out there. There have been a few things. Most of them have been limited, or you have to, their JavaScript libraries or this and that. You have to be a programmer. Um, so Twine is an established tool. It's got a pretty low entry barrier. Why not piggyback on that? Um, you know, it gives you easier, easy branching and just linear stuff. And, you know, sometimes you might want that within a storyless content or whatever. Sometimes you just want a branch so you can just use it. Um, and, you know, it's not too hard to build your own storylets engine. You're basically just looking at all the storylets and saying which one of these fit here. But, you know, it might cost you five hours or 20 hours or 100 to build it. And do you want to write a story or an engine? And so TinyQBN, it's, I'm not saying this is a wonderful thing, but it exists. And, you know, there isn't a lot else out there. If you find something else, that's great. Um, I want to point out AW Frayer's hybrid choices extension for Inform 7 is built to do sort of menu-based stuff in a parser tool, but it has this concept of pages that can have conditions. And as far as I can see, it's basically a basically a complete story that that's engine. Um, yeah. So back to you, I guess, Kat. Yeah. So in order to uh, think about how storylets work, uh, let's go into a particular favorite example of mine. Storylets respond to player focus, and as a result, can offer dramatically different outcomes of any single scene. This presentation is mostly going to look at the Sprawl RPG, but uh, let's take a look at a different design using Arkady Martin's fabulous space opera, A Memory Called Empire. In the novel, Ambassador Mahit Zmar has to navigate a precocious and a, a precarious, rather, uh, an opaque system of bureaucratic secrets within a culture of complex literary illusions. And this kind of high stakes storytelling with a number of different potential outcomes will fit Storylets very well. So let's take a precocious takes Kalanli poet, we'll call her two aquifer here, with unfortunate taste in radical friends as our example, and say that she's been invited to a party in honor of uh, 11 Glasses' recent precarious victory. We can direct her any number of ways here to spend time with her radical friend Six Quartz. Uh, up in the top left there, which might give us rumors of political subversion, or a disillusioned bureaucrat Nine Eclipse, there in the middle, which might give us some knowledge of troop movements. If we visit the conservative social climbing bureaucrat Thirteen Camellia, pictured bottom right, before we talk to Nine Eclipse, Thirteen Camellia might be reluctant to tell us anything before that specific progress marker is open, and any public move we make will raise suspicions around us and cement our reputation. So with stakes this high, we may choose not to meddle in these affairs at all and go hang out by the fish pond, bottom left, very clearly. So this might culminate in a social event where we choose the sort of poetry we would like to recite. Depending on our choices earlier, we might have an array of different contemporary illusions we can make, and those choices will also influence how our audience hears our poetry with sympathy, suspicion, or confusion. If we chose to hang out by the pond, we may only have the option to deliver a villanelle on the movement of fish schools. But even that could be interpreted by Eleven Glass as a critique of her troop movements, which we wouldn't know unless we had talked to her. You could do this scene as a branching narrative, I guess, but I don't see why you'd want to. A party isn't a progressive decision tree where people come to you on a set schedule. It's a fluid, unordered space with a lot of possibilities, and where those possibilities are going to change over time, depending on what's happened earlier in the evening. Storylets are basically designed to make that experience possible. And so Josh is going to go into some of the how that's going to work right now. Right. So we were, you know, we're going to talk sort of primarily about this example from the sprawl, which is a little more complicated, but this might be a simpler way to get started with something. Um, so you can build linear branching arcs with storylets. Just instead of linking directly to the next piece, you add the next piece to the deck so that um, only, only the next piece of each conversation is available to be chosen. Um, and SugarCube, and with TinyQBN, you can set this up. SugarCube allows you to use the link syntax instead of a string to say, this is the passage that you're going to. So then the Twine editor knows, and it can show you the arrows between your passages. So you kind of get all the benefits of building simple branching narratives, but then 
you know, the players can kind of jump between arcs at any given time. And I have an example, which we will put a link to somewhere. Um, and this slide is a picture of sort of here, I just threw in some passages with just some basic branching shapes. And then the code in there is, so you, you put a link there and the text of the link says yes. And it links back to the talk to passage, which is the hub that gives you your next choice of who you're gonna talk to. And then it just says add card, you know, it adds the next piece of the conversation to your deck. Um, and again, yeah, this is something you could build with branching and lots of if statements, but the story lets make it easier to manage. Yeah. Uh, what else do we have? Back to you, I guess. Yeah, so um, absolutely right. Story lets make a lot of things easier to manage. Um, obviously, I'm biased. I'm giving this presentation. Um, so now to talk about specifically the things that it makes it's easier to manage with, uh, I'm going to switch over to our main design example, which is the sprawl, which is also what my editor calls my early drafts. Uh, just kidding, Thomas. Sorry. This is actually uh, Hamish Cameron's Powered by the Apocalypse game, and I'm using it here because it has a lot of characteristics that map well onto storylit design. Chances of success that are modified by stats, auto-fire consequences when a roll breaks bad. So something important to establish from the jump when you're designing storylits is what you want to always happen, no matter if the player succeeds or fails, and no matter what is happening in the particular scene. So because storylet design can be so open, it's really crucial to keep some version of thematic unity in mind. What is your game about? It's okay to have a hypothesis and realize that's not the case as you begin to design. God knows that's happened to me a ton of times, but you should be able to formulate it as a sentence, even from the very beginning. And actually, it's important that you articulate it in a way that you can refer back to. What is always true of the game and what can change from play session to session? So I am as guilty as sprawling design as anyone here, as some of you might remember from last year's talk. <laughs> so let's put this up here to keep me honest as we go along. And as we go to the next slide, our constant principles and what can be present in the possibility space. So in this case, my rule is that players will always have more insight into how the team works as a group. This can be anywhere from, wow, I didn't know our infiltrator could do that, to, oh god, the medic shot the face's brother in the foot during a game of cards, and they are still salty as hell about it. But this is a cyberpunk game about individual people going up against a mostly monolithic and definitely uncaring system. And what I want from that is for that tension, and the character's ingenuity and essential humanness to be on display whether or not they pass or fail a check. There are numerous paths players can navigate through this game's possibility space that will reflect different facets of this fundamental tension. Um, I'm actually going to skip past the pre-mission that the Sprawl usually features in this talk. Uh, the one thing I do want to call out here is that in designing this game, even if the team gets a bunch of good rolls and somehow manages, manages to get surveillance or a map of the building that they're breaking into in the pre-mission, I, as the designer, am not going to give the player a visual representation of that map. And the reason I am not going to do that is because the map and the character's distance from their goal is yet another progress marker that I can, I can mess with and which should be influenced by how the mission is going so far. I'm gonna get more narrative payoff for not showing the map and springing it on them when my tension metric hits a certain level and go, well, actually you've gone down the wrong corridor twice now and isn't everything awful. Storylets are really good at taking an abstract metric stats, a progress counter, abstract information as a quality, and turning that into something particular and specific when it's fired. If my Shadowrunner PC acquires compromising information, I can choose to spring that when talking my way past a guard, convincing a scientist to betray their corporate masters, or blackmailing the CEO. Leaving the possibilities abstract until the moment the player chooses what they mean allows the player to determine how they or their characters interpret the game world. And that's a lot harder to do if you've already made more things more specific than the situation requires them to be. And so part of storylet design is ceding some control over to the player and figuring out what version of the character they want to play is. There are a couple different power fantasies in cyberpunk, and these can range from we are seasoned underworld operatives running the slickest operation this side of Neo Fargo, to when I open my mouth, let's both find out what happens. And this is another overarching principle. I want my players to be able to decide if they want to bullshit their way through an encounter or if they want to have meticulously planned for just such an issue. 
We could call these planning versus pantsing, with apologies to the SFF writers community, or we could call them meticulous versus improvisational. And so I'm going to put that up here in the present impossibility space, because not every choice is going to be meticulous versus improvisational, but they are going to affect how our players traverse through this space. So let's dive in and take a look at this chunk of story here. So in this example, our team has to get past a series of guards. We're going to need three successes here to get through to the next chunk of story. As you can see, there are several options here. You can ask the hacker to break into the guard's personal device so that when you lean over the counter to flirt with them, you can target the incredibly specific weird thing that they're secretly into and you've just found out about. Or you can have set up your infiltrator to be crawling through the vents and to drop down at your signal, knocking out the guard. Or you can straight up punch the guard in the face. The first two are going to lean toward the meticulous style of player expression and the last will lean toward the improvisational, as those uh, lines in gray are going to show you. Um, quick note, obviously there are a lot of UX considerations to make when figuring out how to foreground this to the player. Uh, this is not a UX talk. I'd also probably consider doing this as a tooltip if I had more time, but then even with a tooltip, you uh, are gonna risk players not reading that info and being surprised by their decision. So again, that is a UX decision that I leave it in everybody else's hands to make. So picking one in the first circumstance, in the first version of uh, targeting guard, isn't going to obligate you to pick the same action or even the same type of action in the next. If you had the hacker mess with the guard's device, for instance, you can just punch the next guard in the face. So there is that granular possibility. But enough actions in one category will, by the end of the game, make that one a safer option. You can always switch up and move to the other type if you get a set of options where your stats are high enough that the alternate makes more sense, or if it just seems more fun. There's no penalty, just a bonus of higher odds on the one that you've been doing more of this, for this whole time, which makes sense from a narrative perspective. You've gotten into a groove, and so you're less likely to make mistakes when operating on those same principles, uh, as we are going to see on that next slide. Failures also don't affect pacing. This is a dramatic action sequence that we're doing, so I want the story to keep moving no matter what. You try the door and roll a six, the door is locked, so try three more times is really no fun to do. So instead, in my game, failure is going to impact how things are going more generally. We're going to call this stat clean mission versus messy mission. The more successes you roll, which are influenced by your character's stats and how comfortable you're getting with the strategy, the cleaner the mission will be. In a clean mission, this is essentially a heist montage full of seasoned operatives. They're all very good at their job. Maybe some of them even get along. In a messy mission, pressures mount up. There are conflicting desires, some of the team has complicated history, a whole series of cascading issues that will get worse and throw their own hindrances into the heist as it goes on. This can be illustrated in auto-fire storylets that have to be dealt with, but it can also be signaled more subtly with dirty looks, heated crosstalk, and descriptions of passive-aggressive attempts at sabotage. Uh, clean miss mission versus messy mission is the way of tracking tension that I'd previously established. We'll also have a progress tracker, but a progress tracker is not the same as a tension tracker, uh, although I can imagine designs for which they are the same, a high schooler having a conversation with her crush, for instance. In this game, though, a clean mission, where a player plays conservatively and to their team's strengths, will offer the feeling of tension held in check and of well-executed techniques, whether the PC is improvising or planning exhaustively. A messy mission will instead involve feelings of everything unraveling, whether the exhaustively researched plan is falling apart or no one's buying our PC's improv skills. Both of these things will show us things about our characters, but it's going to be about who they are on a good day versus who they are on a really bad one. Tension then is keyed towards success or failure roles, which are at least partially determined by chance and partially by the player's choices and also the stats that influence them. So, but we also want the players to have some control over messy versus clean missions. The design decision I mentioned earlier about having the option to double down on what's been working so far, planning versus pantsing, will allow players who want the clean mission power fantasy, but have had dice rolls break bad for, for them to take back a bit of that control. 
if I were designing a different game, there are places where you could have an option that's actually locked with something like have plus 35 planner or meticulous to unlock this option, or that otherwise depends on how much of a progress stat the player has. Because this game is about feeling either like a competent professional or an otherwise competent professional who is having a really bad day, I don't want to taunt my player with the sense that somehow they played wrong by not committing enough to one path or the other. But this is a common enough uh, design technique in storylet design that I think it is worth shouting out here. Alternately, uh, players who want to see how bad things can get have a variety of ways to play around with this. They can test out techniques they haven't invested up in up until now, or they can ask team members to perform actions their stats aren't suited for. But this is cyberpunk, and cyberpunk is about difficult decisions that have no real winning answers. So I don't want players to be able to pick their goal, commit to it, and execute on it without ever ever having to be tempted to change their strategy. That's not very cyberpunk. And so we see on the right of what happens if you have chosen something and you end up with a messy mission. We have our infiltrator who is a little bit frustrated and our hacker who has something that they would like to share. So now that I've demonstrated the scene, I'm going to throw it back to Josh so that he can talk you how this example will have worked on the code side of TinyQBN. Josh? Right. So I think sort of the biggest thing in designing a story that's thing and then implementing it is just being pretty clear about, okay, what information makes up your story state? And then how do you represent that information as data in the computer? So in this case, we have some sort of overall progress thing, you know, which um, in this quick little thing that I did, I just used a list of what phase are we at. Um, it could also be more sort of free form story -led dependencies. This thing can't happen until you've gotten past the guards, whatever. Um, so in this case, we have um, the Powered by the Apocalypse model. You roll 2d6, you add the stat, and then you check it against these thresholds to see did you get a bad result. You get sort of a mixed success, or did you get a good result? Um, and that allows the player stats to be just integers from minus 1 to plus 2. And so adding a, adding 1 to your stat is like a big deal. Um, we also have um, clean versus messy mission, and we have this meticulous versus improvisational play style. And those I chose here to represent as proportions. So we keep account of how many meticulous choices did you make? How many improvisational ones did we take? And then, you know, look at what fraction of those did you do either way? You know, which works well because you can always sort of get to the extremes. And, um, you know, sometimes there are choices that aren't either. And those just sort of don't count. So, yeah. Um, so to set those up then, I guess on the next slide here, how do we do that in, um, in Twine? So the way I've done this is mostly that you're just using straight up Twine variables. So the very first one of these, this, this progress is a, this is a macro that I've written for TinyQBN that lets you um, keep a progress indicator as, as a list of named states. So very often in other things, I mean, story nexus basically just has integers. So if you want to do a progress indicator as a number, you have to keep track of, okay, what does each number mean? And what if you want to insert something in the center, then you have to like renumber all the things. So this is, we can just say, hey, give it a variable name. We're going to call this mission. And first you have to get the job and then you have to do the legwork and then you have to get past the guards and then you hack in and get the pay data and then you have to get out and so on. Um, and we have ways to just advance that easily. So you can just name them, you can refer to them by name. If you need to insert or delete in the middle, it's no big deal. So that's a little convenience there. The rest of these are just straight up, um, straight up twine variables. So we have two counters here. I'm setting clean to one and messy to one. I think actually I set them to some small fraction just so that there would be something there so that your first choice wouldn't push you all the way to 100% in one direction. Um, and then we did the same thing with meticulous and improvised. And then the other ones, then, you know, theoretically, we would have all six stats for each of your um, party members. So you have an infiltrator here, a hacker, and a player. Um, then what are we doing? Okay, so more on progress variables here on this next slide. Um, so again, this is how you define this. You're going to want to put that in your story init thing. So it's there from the beginning. And also, this stores the progress in a thing that doesn't build up in your sugar cube history and like slow your game down or whatever. So it needs to be done at the very beginning. Um, so then if you, if you print out the mission variable, it's stored as a string. So that'll give get job. When you first start off, we have this advance 
macro. And you notice here that you have to pass the name of the variable as a string because it needs to modify it. Um, this is just a thing about how SugarCube works. So that will advance it by one step. So if we advance mission, now it'll be at the legwork phase. And then you can also tell it to go to a particular state. And that, that goes either forward or backward. It just finds that state in your list and just goes straight there. Um, you generally don't want to put spaces in your progress names because one of the limitations of how TinyQBN is set up is that we can't put spaces in our requirements or conditions on the storylets. Um, yeah, next then, I guess. Uh, so then the other two are as these ratio stats that, you know, John Ingold from Inkle has talked about liking here. So when we have a success or a failure role, we just have that code set up that we use it for everything and it just automatically increments the appropriate one. So set plus plus dollars clean or dollars messy, depending on which, which way your role goes. Um, I did not make it do anything on a mixed role. I figured, okay, that's sort of somewhere in the middle. So maybe it balances out. Um, and then just the math of this is what we do with these, um, how we convert it to a percentage to display it to the player maybe. So we just take the clean and then we divide by the whole total of how many decisions have you made either way and then multiply by 100 to get a percent. And I've made that, I've turned it into an integer just so it doesn't show up with bazillion digits after the decimal point. And then so in SugarCube, there are two types of variables. There are story variables with a dollar sign that get tracked and they're sort of permanent throughout your story. But then for a lot of things in TinyQBN, we'll just use these temporary variables that start with an underscore and they're just kind of in the current moment. They're just on the current page. And then also we have math to convert to a sort of minus one to plus one range so that we can use that for a stat buff or debuff for when we're rolling against these things. Ah, so then how do we do storylets here, I guess? <clears throat> so some passages are storylets. Um, we use Twine's passage tags to declare requirements, and then the requirements can match against your Twine variables, and then we have a few functions to sort of select and display the matching storylets. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have there. So then a passage is or can be a storylet, and your initial deck of the ones that are available to be selected from are determined by the passage tag. So you tag a passage as card to make it a single-use storylet, and then once you, once you see that content, it'll just go away. And then if you have something that's like a location or, you know, maybe it's one of the radio stations that you can hear or something that you're going to come back to again and again, you make it a sticky card so it stays in the deck. Um, you can also, as we talked about in the party example there, you can manipulate the deck manually. So you could make passages that have requirements but aren't actually available to select at all originally. Or you can just have sticky cards that you take out at some point. So you just add card or remove card and you pass the name. And there's also an option to take out only if it's a single use storylet. So I guess let's look at selecting storylets. Um, this is sort of like an auto fire kind of thing. It's sort of an invisible passage. So we use a temporary variable event. So I usually set a temporary variable to true for a basic sort of enable this set of storylets kind of thing. So this might be, oh, here's a location or here's sort of a, a deck of storylets. Um, you just kind of use that as an identifier. So here we're selecting the next major event that's going to happen to you. You're going to encounter a guard or you're going to, something's going to happen. Um, and then we get the list. We say set underscore storylets to qbn.cards. And by default, this gives you all the ones that match. But here we're just asking for only one, which will be chosen randomly. Um, it's good practice to then unset the flag, because if we let it on and we did another selection on the same page, then an event might show up in there. Um, so this is, I don't know. I, it's. It's tempting to think of storylet selection as being kind of like a database query where you're saying, give me these particular things, but it's really like the storylets are kind of doing the selection. So if you kind of like make the condition say, oh, this storylet can match, then it's always going to match. And it's not, you, you have to sort of turn the very, you have to change the story state to, to make them go away. So you have to be a little careful about unsetting things. Um, and then since we're only selecting one here, we use go to, to, send the player directly there without having to click an extra link. And in a lot of places, then you'll show several options and let the user pick one. So that's, I think, what's on the next slide. Yeah, sort of. So this is 
the guard one that we probably looked at before I cut some of the text out here. So this is a card. It's a single, we're not going to see this event more than once. Um, we say require event. So we have to have an event variable that's set to some sort of value that's true. Um, and then this, this during requirement is works with the progress variables. So this says rec mission. So it looks at the mission variable and it says during first guard. Um, so here I just I just made it you and prior you encounter one guard, two guard, three guard. Um, you know, in a more flexible thing, you might just have the story let's say, well, you can't encounter this one until you've gotten there, or maybe there are multiple paths through the map. But in this case, we say the progress marker is at the first guard phase. And then the guard encounter is just another tag that we've set because um, the options that we see here for how do you deal with this guard can can filter on that. So, um, and the way this game is set up, you're always going to get past the guard. You know, failure is going to make your life more complicated, or it's going to be relatively straightforward. So we go ahead and we just advance the mission counter. Um, so then we get the options again. Um, this one. The the card selection thing randomizes the order by default, and I didn't want that here. I wanted them to be in a consistent order. So, uh, so the first argument being null there says just get as many. You know, there's no numerical limit. We're not putting a number there. Just get all of them. Um, and then true says keep them in order. And then to display them all, we say include all, and that just takes a list of passage names. So, and then there's we have one example here of one of the three options that you have here. So that having the infiltrator deal with the guard, it's a sticky card. I don't know why I did that. I don't suppose it. Oh, OK. So this is a sticky card because you can use this option again when you encounter the next guard. So it needs to stay there. Um, and then it's got a requirement that says it only shows up if you're in a passage that's tagged with guard encounter. Um, and yeah, so this just has the text. And it links to it links to a passage then that's going to show the die the die roll. And yeah, I think that's that for that one. So then this is what the dice roll looks like. Um, so we're rolling against a bonus here. We take the infiltrator's cool stat, and then we add a, a plotter faction uh, um, modifier. So this is how meticulous are you? So if you're very meticulous, this is going to be is it going to give you a bonus if you've been very improvisational? it's going to be a debuff. Um, and then we roll bonus. So ignore those numbers at the end of the roll bonus. So I'm just sticking those in there to force a success here. Um, normally you just say roll bonus and it will set a variable. It'll set bad or good or mixed, depending on which, which way the die roll comes out. Um, so then this is a meticulous choice. You know, this involves planning to get your infiltrator up in the vent there. Um, so we're going to increase our meticulous count. And then we're going to display the results. And I've only put one result here. So this is entwine. So if, if each passage is a story lit, you could have each possible result be a passage. But in the graphical editor, sometimes that's just, I mean, that adds up to a lot of passages. And you're constantly opening this one and closing that one and opening the other one. So you also have the option, if you have a set of choices that are only going to apply at one point, you can do this choices thing. And we give a variable name to put them in. And we say when, and this gives the tag. So this is a sticky card. And then it requires the good result, good die roll result. And then we say offer, and that shows the contents that you get when, when that story lit fires. Um, so then we just include those and we have the choices thing just puts all of the possible options into its little array. So we have to filter that and we're asking for one of these and then we're displaying it. Um, so in a real thing, there would be a bunch more options here of what happens when it goes bad, what happens when it, you get a mixed result, what, and maybe there's just some random other thing that happens sometimes too. And then we link on to continue. And when you click this link, it doesn't go anywhere. It includes our start, our hub passage there, which just, and that will randomly pick the next event for us and go on to presumably the next card in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thinking about what we said earlier about wanting to tempt players away from being 
consistently happy and consistently in control with their decisions, uh, right? It's cyberpunk. We want to make sure that they're at least sweating it a little bit. So in terms of forcing players to make tough calls, um, I think the easiest place to go is to a staple of the cyberpunk genre, which is the hacking scene. So here we're going to look at our hacker getting into a representation of the computer system. Again, we can have the UI conversation in another talk. The mission that we've presented here is to get a certain amount of evidence from this corporation about what they're doing in terms of tax fraud. But once you're into the system, your hacker has a bunch of different places that he can go. The higher the payoff for the information, the more threatening the security is that's guarding it, and the higher the chance that your hacker will get burned, his deck will get fucked, or the whole team will get caught. But on the other hand, if you go only for the safest option, you're not going to be able to get what you came for. You have to take at least one risk. The question then becomes, how many risks are you going to take? Which risks are you going to take? And in what order? Uh, this is essentially a little bit like playing blackjack and trying not to get over 21. Um, what I've done here is I've said low risk, low reward, medium risk, medium reward, and high risk, high reward. Of course, the thing that you came to get uh, is screamingly obvious that it is the thing that you were hired to get. Um, but for the other ones, I've said low risk, low reward, specifically because I don't want it to be easy for players to know what exactly the calculation is here. Um, there are other ways to do this, right? You could say 80% chance, or you could say a pretty good chance, or a four in five shot. Humans are really, really bad at understanding probability. And so you should make your call based on that. Here, I'm kind of leaning into that and going, if I tell you that you are 80% likely to have a success and you roll this twice and it fails twice, which is absolutely a thing that can happen if you are using four out of five odds, I have seen players get very upset about these odds. And so here I am specifically leaning into the obfuscation and not letting anybody get frustrating, frustrated about that. Um, also, your storylit design obviously doesn't need to center around player success or failure, uh, just because that's what I'm doing here. Uh, it doesn't need to center around expressing that in probability terms. And one of the things that's useful about demonstrating in this way is that you get a kind of flavor text here out of low risk, low reward, high risk, high reward, medium risk, mission completion reward. It doesn't feel good to finish the mission, but when this scene is embedded in a larger structure in which you will get a larger payoff and ostensibly the people who have hired you to do this will be very, very angry if you do not do the thing. And I can think of lots of storylets that will fire should that occur. Um, it then becomes more tempting. And so you're relying here on flavor text rather than numbers to make those calls for you. And of course, and you I can think get the, out at any time. And I think the other mechanical thing that we talked about here is that sort of if you've been more meticulous, then you get a bonus for the thing that you were trying, that you were hired to get. And if you've been more improvisational, you get a bonus for the, you know, going off the script. Exactly. Uh, you get... A bonus if you are essentially doing the thing that you have been doing so far as a reward. And so to wrap up, I want to pull back from this specific design, which we've seen examples of. We've seen how you would uh, integrate this mechanically. We've seen how the code works on the code side. But I want to touch on other ways of structuring storylets because Obviously, you are not going to all go forth and build the next sprawl mechanic. But the important thing to remember is to make sure that the way you are structuring your storylets amplifies your design intents. So I want to talk briefly about how to serve up these storylets to your players. There's no one right way. You want to make different design decisions based on the pacing and the mood. And also, again, I'm going to go through these three basic styles, but as we mentioned before, uh, not every game that uses storylets is purely storylet uh, is purely storylet based. Uh, it can have other elements like branch and bottleneck designs. And as a result, not all of these are like clearly delineated. Uh, some combine, say, two and three. Nothing that is pure storylet always 
I shouldn't say nothing, but very little that is pure story lit always sticks to one philosophy. It's because it's a broad genre and you can do a lot of things with it. So the first scenario, the program curates likely story lits for you to choose between. And then the player will select one. Relevance is most often decided based on tagging and waiting. Um, there aren't many there aren't as many interactive fiction games in this category as I'm specifically defining it as I'd like. Um, the unfortunately unavailable B, which was made in Very Tale, did a version of this. Um, and Why Are We Like This, which is an in-development project from Mac Max Kraminski and Melanie Dickinson, allows players, or uh, co-authors as they refer to them, to hone the focus of what those players would like to accomplish. And then using that criteria, the game will present a number of possible actions that will fulfill those criteria. Both of the games that I've mentioned here are about developing and understanding agency within a complex system of soft social pressures, which fits well with a method that offers players both agency and some constraint. Two, the program picks the most relevant story lit for you to deal with and auto fires it. In that second scenario, the Storylit engine is going to look at what is available and then auto-fire that to the player. This is closer to what Emily Short has called salience-based narrative in that the most salient thing is the thing that's delivered. Uh, again, the engine here is looking for the most number of tags that are relevant. If there's a tie, it's probably picking randomly. Um, in her blog post on this, uh, Emily noted that this design is frequently used in narrative design in 3D spaces. Uh, Firewatch uses a system like this, um, although I am specifically choosing not to talk about storylit narrative over 3D spaces in this talk because it feels like an entirely different category with its own nuances. Uh, so instead, for the second category, a game like Six Ages, which feels to me like it's about overwhelming you with a lot of possible actions and the cascading consequences of what you've chosen already, alternates between uh, system number two and system number three down here, which is that storylets are in fixed locations and possible ac actions on them update as the game progresses. Um, these are usually in fixed locations, uh, often actual tangible places, uh, open world sandboxy games map onto this pretty well. Fallen London does a lot of this design, uh, though obviously within an individual storylet that sometimes get changed up. Um, and the design decisions, not, not uh, the the decisions you can make in your village uh, in Six Ages, depending on the season, also uh, varies there. And so four is here as catch-all category, a bucket of other possibilities, because that's sort of the point of storylets. They can do way more than can be easily defined in one presentation. Oftentimes when you make a rule about them, you can break it just as easily. And so the one thing I would want to end on is to keep in mind that your design in terms of how you are implementing your storylets and serving them up to your players should always be in service of the larger themes of your project. And I'd like to throw over to Josh. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would note that Tiny QBN was deliberately sort of a small project. Um, it falls sort of on the shallower end of that. So the library really only does kind of binary true or false. Is this thing available or not? Um, it manages which, which storylets are even possible for you to select and which ones you've already seen or, you know, they're just not part of your deck. Um, so so the thing that you mostly have for selecting, you know, relevant storylets is, are these available at all? And then you can kind of randomly select, you know, just randomly select one or three or five or however many you want or show all of them. Um, there are, I did put in story nexuses, three levels of priority. So there's, you know, just normal storylets. And then there's important ones that are chosen first if you're choosing a random subset. And then there are urgent ones that urgent ones sort of lock out everything else. So, you know, you can't ignore the assassin that's trying to kill you to go, you know, take your laundry off the line, even if it's about to start raining, you know. Um, it is possible to do some filtering afterwards that would rank things. I've been messing around a little bit for the Nariscope Jam with a system that plays with position in the twine editor of your passages is actual sort of in world space. So like, can you, how close are these objects to you and can you, can you reach them as you grow bigger or whatever? Um, but that definitely gets into write a small JavaScript function that does the filtering and stuff for you. Um, 
so yeah and of course there are yeah lots of other bigger um ways to do this i feel like UC Santa Cruz for the last, you know, what, 10 or 15 years, there've been a lot of grad students through there doing some pretty amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's about what I've got. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of different ways to do storylets. We are just giving you one very specific one that will kind of set you up from start to finish uh, through the pipeline if you've got something you'd like to play around with in Twine. Uh, thanks so much. There. Okay. Uh, I'm going to switch back to uh, the speakers uh, live, and they cat uh, had cat uh, wanted to say something, and then we'll take questions. Yeah. Um, so this talk was pre-recorded, and I can't really go farther today without addressing our current social context: um, the violence against Black Americans and the police militarization in response to the protests over this. Um, I want to urge all of you watching to make a contribution to a bail bond fund, um, and the link to that will be dropped in the Twitch chat and to mutual aid networks in your area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I saw that Josh was answering some questions in chat already, um, but if people can post more questions, I'll uh, repeat them in voice, uh, please. Precede your question with the word question so that it's easier for me to see. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. There was a question uh, up earlier about making this a story format within Twine rather than a, the, the current state of things. Uh, do you want to speak more to that? Oh, I have sort of a love-hate relationship with Twine. I love that. I love that it takes and says here anyone who can put double square brackets around a piece of text can go make a story, but then. Uh, after that, it kind of dumps you into here, go learn web dev a little bit more quickly than I would like. Um, both Harlow and Sugarcube have design decisions that I'm not super happy with. Um, so yeah, I keep thinking about making a story format. I haven't sort of wanted to dilute that space further, um, but I might do that at some point. I also, I've been programming since I was 13 in 93, so a long time, mostly as a hobbyist, but I've tinkered with like programming language design and stuff. So I would also be really tempted to make something that says here, you don't have to do JavaScript at all. You know, let's take the design of something like Lua that's a really carefully designed, very small language. And let's maybe combine that with some sort of natural languages syntax from Inform7 and be like, here, let's make this really cool thing that you don't have to touch JavaScript at all. Um, and then also like the Twine editor, you know, has some bugs that, I mean, I think that, you know, it's a volunteer project and all that, but there have been some sort of annoying bugs that have not gotten found and fixed yet. So I keep also getting tempted to be like, and it's not very mobile or screen reader friendly at all, as far as I can tell. Um, so it's like, I'm also tempted to like, could I make an editor that does like drag and drop visual coding and lets you like nest passages and collapse them for organizational purposes. And yeah, in all my spare time, of course. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have messed around with making story formats a little bit. It's not, it's not hard. Mm, uh, yeah, Dan Cox says he's, well, uh, he's, he'd be happy to hand over his notes on working on story formats. Um, right. If you want. And also the, and also the IFTIF recently published specs on that stuff, which is, makes it much easier than before it was like, oh, go read the source code to one of the existing ones and see if you can figure out how that works. And now there's documentation, which is which is awesome. Which I don't know if Dan was involved in that or not, but that was a great little project there. I think you were right. Uh, um, David asking, uh, Kat, would you say more about cr cranking up the tension metric? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there are a couple of ways that you can do this. And the thing that I would sort of advocate the most is uh, don't go more complicated than you need to go. Um, for a variety of different uh, games or projects uh, in the interactive narrative space, you really are only going to need uh, kind of a, a basic incrementer that uh, fires whenever um, a particular action is taken. Um, so, so in the sprawl, uh, when um, uh, a, a, what we'd call a hard move is made in the uh, Powered by the Apocalypse system, a, six, a roll of six or lower. Um, we might crank up the tension then, just as like a one tick 
uh, mark upward on a clock. Um, for a more complicated project, we might want to use something like a drama manager that will um, check to see where that tension manager is and weight it against where uh, the, the game thinks the tension should be in the scene. So for instance, if you have a complex game with a lot of different storylets and you're entering into what looks like, say, act two, uh, even though I don't necessarily know that acts are the right framework for this, um, so if you're entering into quote unquote act two, you might have an idea of where you would like the tension to be at the beginning of act two and then begin to ratchet it up from there. Now, if that tension isn't is much uh, lower than where it is, you might want to suddenly throw a bunch of tension increasing storylets at the player. Um, if it's much higher than where it is, you might wanna have like a little bit of an interstitial lull in terms of scenes that won't ratchet up the tension metric or even just scenes that don't feel uh, very, like they're weighing on the plot at all, just to kind of relax some of that forward momentum and that kind of um, uh, white knuckling uh, uh, grip on the plot there. Um, but again, that's, more necessary, I think, when you have a larger or a more complex plot where the player has a lot of different paths through the story volume, uh, which is a Jason Grinblatt term. Um, and I think in a lot of situations, uh, we like to make things, or at least I like to make things harder for myself because it's more interesting to. And so there are stories where you don't necessarily need that kind of complexity, um, simply just a tension metric that measures uh, failures or difficult actions or um, things that in general cause the stakes to raise um, in the story. Uh, just a, a regular numerical in, uh, incrementer will work for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have Michael asking, uh, what complementary tools would you use to follow the various variables you're working on? Spreadsheets, mind maps, what? Oh, I love spreadsheets for this, uh, but I love spreadsheets for everything. Um, <laughs> the good thing about spreadsheets is that they can plug into other things. Uh, which is very nice. So if you realize uh, halfway through that, that somewhere having that list of variables um, and, and tuning those numbers in Excel is useful to your actual project, you can port it pretty easily. Uh, Max Kraminski asking, uh, any thoughts about testing storylet based narratives? Are automated random walks sufficient or are there problems with that or are there other strategies? This is a Josh question. Ooh, I, <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't gone far enough to experiment with that. I would think it sort of depends on how homogenous your story volume is. Mm -hmm. um, I could certainly also see a tester that deliberately sets your, your, your stat variables to various points in the story space and then kind of moves on from there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have not done a lot of work with that enough to know. I suspect there are certainly cases where it would not be adequate. Yeah, um, that's about my feeling as well. Um, I'm very lucky in that uh, a great deal of my testing uh, in Storylets has been done by other people. Um, and I'm very ha uh, grateful for that. Um, I've found random walks to be to cover a, a good portion of cases, uh, but there's definitely been times when I have felt, at least personally, um, that they're not a, a fully uh, that they're they're not a tool that covers everything fully. Um, and frankly, I I don't have a better option currently. Um, and I would love to know what's worked for other people um, who are working in the story lift space for that. I mean, certainly in the programming sort of space, there's a lot, there's all sorts of things like these fuzzing tools that are like, oh, give it an input and we're going to try other things around that and see if we can make it break. Yeah, I haven't, in the narrative space though, it's like people tend to be more creative types rather than programmer types. So I don't know that there's been a lot of work done. I certainly haven't seen anything much. It seems like there's some interesting possibilities, but. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, All right, what do we got next? Let's see. Feel free to read the questions yourself. <laughs> Let's see, I know there were examples of querying the current passages tags for requirements. Does it support requirements based off of numeric values? Yes. Um, so you say, so tags starting with req dash are requirements, and then you can do basic comparisons. You can say equal, not equal, less than, greater than, um, with a number, or you can say equal or not equal with a string. I just, over the weekend for this talk, I added the ones that say, are you at a particular passage? Is this passage have a tag? Has this passage been visited? 
And I also added EQ var, not EQ var, to check a variable against another variable. And if you go look at the documentation, so the, the tags are very limited because they get turned into CSS classes. So they have to be sort of identifiers. They can't be like, um, they can't have spaces or most punctuation. So if you want to do multiple comparisons, I made a range variable that kind of divides up like the number line into with tick marks and like names the spaces between. So then you can check against those things. Um, but yeah, that stuff. What else? Um, question, when all these passages and states are gated by stats and tension variables, does that make it tricky to ensure that the paths are being accessed? A little bit related to quest testing question above. Kat, do you have thoughts on that? So, so my experience on this is that um, every every time that I've sort of uh, done the random walk thing, um, it's come up if if there is that issue. Essentially, um, I can see pretty easily if uh, a lot of paths just are not hitting a certain story volume. Um, sorry, a certain place in the story volume. Um, and at that point, what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll tweak my variables and see if that changes and allows any more sort of run throughs to uh, to reach that place more easily. Yeah, that might be an interesting tool. It'd be something that would just sort of graph where are you at in your story volume every turn and see if there are holes on there. That would be a really interesting tool for someone to make. And let's see, Allison Parrish says, are there any games out there that you think are especially innovative or interesting in how they present story options, game state, et cetera, to the player? Ooh, that is a question I'm probably going to get more into on Discord because I want the time to think about it. But um, the two that uh, uh, come to mind uh, immediately for me um, are the, the project that I mentioned earlier uh, from uh, Max and Melanie, uh, Why Are We Like This? Um, because the way that it uh, surfaces storylets to players as possible actions. First of all, uh, both uh, changes depending on what the player has selected their interests are, but also it allows a feature for players to annotate those storylets once they are fired with what the player believes happened. And so there's kind of this, this co-creativity between the player and the game engine that I think is really, really cool. Um, so I'm really excited to see more of their work on that. And um, I also really like uh, Bruno Diaz's um, Voyager, which I think you can grab on uh, itch.io on, on his page as well, which is a one-way uh, trip through the galaxy. Um, and what I really like about that, and, and, and there are a bunch of different storylets as the, the, that you access as you go through. And what I like about that is to me, it feels like the map through the game maps to the map through the storylets in, in a really sort of interesting and effective way. Um, so those are the those are the two that come to mind first, but um, I'm going to take some time to think about this because it's a really good question. Okay, um, we are approaching uh, the next talk, so I'm going to say we can switch over to Discord now. Uh, please use the question and answers to channel uh, for this talk. Uh, thank you so much for speaking and presenting and you know recording a video for us. Thank you. Thank you.